Bonjour, euh, mesdames, messieurs. Je voudrais d'abord féliciter toute l'équipe du sommet sur leur euh, euh, réussite évidente euh, et aussi euh, remercier M. Tapi pour votre hospitalité à Essec. C'est la première fois que je rends visite à ces lieux. Et je trouve ça très pratique d'avoir euh, un business school dans un centre commercial. Parce qu'il doit y avoir pas mal d'hommes d'affaires qui sortent pour acheter un costume, quelques cravates, et qui rentrent à la maison avec un diplôme en comptabilité ou euh, je ne sais pas quoi. Euh, J'admirais euh, votre citation de Adam Smith, mais je dois vous prévenir que c'est la dernière fois que vous allez pouvoir citer Adam Smith à un sommet franco-britannique. Parce qu'il y aura un référendum en Écosse bientôt, et j'attends à ce que les Écossais deviennent indépendants euh, d'ici 18 mois. Donc, euh, après ça, Adam Smith sera un « non-person euh, » en, en Angleterre et euh, vos citations seront seulement pour le sommet franco-écossais. But I was uh, told that the language of this conference was English, reflecting the monoglot nation uh, that I come from. Uh, so I will um, switch into that. Um, it's nice to see that there are people here from Oxford, where I was educated, from the LSE, where I was director, and from Sciences Po, where I now teach, as well, of course, as a few people uh, from less favored institutions. Um, <laughs> but I hope that those others will not feel intimidated and simply bask in the reflected glory of your uh, colleagues from those three universities uh, for the next couple of days. Um, it's um, uh, true that I was asked if I would first of all comment on the topics you're going to discuss this afternoon, uh, which I will do, um, and I was asked also to give the answers later um, at the British Embassy, which is slightly odd, uh, but nonetheless I will try to meet this. And later on um, I will be much franker because of course then I will be on British territory and out of the reach uh, of the French thought police um, who would uh, probably take issue with some of the things I will say then. So what I would like to do uh, just briefly is offer one or two comments on the topics that you're going to discuss this afternoon, perhaps more on some than on others reflecting the state of my knowledge and understanding. Firstly, the euro, where you're supposed to be asking what the effect of the euro is. Uh, frequently, I have heard people say, ah, well, this is too early. And usually, they trot out one of the most hoary quotations, which has been used by politicians now for 50 years, where Zhou Enlai is supposed to have said to Henry Kissinger, who asked him what he thought about the French Revolution and the impact that Zhou Enlai was supposed to have said, it is far too early to say. And this is frequently quoted as a wonderful example of Chinese long-sightedness and wisdom. It turns out this quote is complete rubbish. And Henry Kissinger's translator, who delivered some memoirs recently, very recently, has said that actually this was a result of a complete misunderstanding and that Kissinger and Zhou Enlai were talking about les événements de 68, um, when Zhou Enlai perfectly reasonably said, when asked, you know, by Kissinger fairly soon after what he thought this might mean, said, well, you know, it's too early to say, as you might reasonably have said in 1970. Uh, so we do need, uh, however, to take a bit of perspective on the euro and ask ourselves um, whether the euro has actually achieved anything. Um, and if so, what? Now, in the UK, as you know, it's, it's fashionable to uh, decry the euro. Much nonsense is talked about it. But if we look at what people have said, more objective uh, observers have said, then the European Commission published a paper on the 10th anniversary um, of the euro, uh, which noted that the trade benefits presumed um, from a single currency in Europe had been rather less than was hoped measured by whether the intensity of trade between countries who had joined the single currency had grown more rapidly than between countries which were not in the single currency. And the answer to that was, broadly speaking, no. Trade had not grown more rapidly. The second question they asked was, had the Eurozone's economies become more synchronized? 
um, which is probably an important criterion of a single currency area. Um, and the answer to that was no. There was no evidence that they had been. Um, but they did say that it was clear that financial markets were growing together. Um, and that the cross-border financial flows within the Eurozone had increased uh, dramatically and much more than in other European countries not members of the Euro. The last point, since this paper on the 10th anniversary of the Euro, uh, the last point has now gone into reverse. I've just finished working on a paper for the McKinsey Global Institute, which was just published last week, uh, which shows that since 2007, the cross-border flows within uh, the Eurozone have fallen by um, 60 percent. Uh, between 1999 and 2007, uh, cross-border flows grew by 8.7 trillion euros, and between 2007 and 12, they are down by 3.7 trillion euros. And as once was famously remarked in the US, a trillion here, a trillion there, and pretty soon you're talking real money. Uh, so what we have seen is a major dismantling of the single financial market. Why is this happening? Well, it's a lack of confidence by investors in other countries, particularly in peripheral Europe, combined with a nationalistic approach now being taken by banking regulators in countries within Europe, within the Eurozone and without it. And they are requiring banks to keep their capital at home. And so we've seen banks being required to sell institutions elsewhere. The British banks have been selling up in France and in Spain and Italy. Uh, Credit Agricole has sold subsidiaries in Greece and wherever. Santander has sold subsidiaries. And basically, they are being told to bring their capital back home and strengthen their domestic base. And this is really because, and uh, to quote uh, Mervyn King, who is English, not uh, Scottish, he, the last Englishman to run the Bank of England, probably, um, that Mervyn King said that banks, international banks, are global in life but national in death, by which he meant they may be operating all around the world, but actually when they collapse, there is their, only their home central bank and their home treasury that actually rescues them. And so regulators and central banks and finance ministers have said, we're not sure we like this fact that Credit Agricole has a bank in Greece uh, because it turns out we're responsible for this. So please could you get rid of it? Which they did for, I think, possibly one euro, though I'm not sure the Greeks have actually paid it yet. Um, but this retreat from cross-border banking is quite a serious uh, phenomenon and one which is so far under-discussed, I think. Part of the reason is undoubtedly that the single financial market was set up without the institutions to back it up. There was no EU-wide regulator, no deposit protection scheme across Europe, no resolution authority, and the recent moves towards banking union attempt to fill that gap. But the big question is, is it enough? Because so far we still don't have a resolution authority, we still don't have a pan-European deposit protection scheme, essentially uh, because the Germans will not back a deposit protection scheme which may involve them in bailing out uh, peripheral European countries. So the question I think the realist has to put under the heading of the euro is can the European single financial market be rescued? Because at the moment it's coming apart. Let's be clear about that. Which leads us into uh, session two on financial regulation. Now here um, I was the UK's financial regulator uh, for six, well, I was the banking regulator for eight years and I was regulator for everything for six years. And at that time, up to 2003, I can tell you that nobody was interested in what I did. Um, when at dinner parties with my wife and people would say, this financial services authority, vaguely, uh, no, wh what is it? And I, as a practical man, would begin to answer. My wife would regularly kick me under the table and say, darling, nobody's interested. They're only being polite. Please don't explain. And so I would give up and talk about football or the other things that British people prefer to talk about. We don't like talking about ideas, as Monsieur Tepi will well know. Um, so, uh, now, unfortunately, everybody is interested in financial regulation and everybody thinks uh, they know all about it. I don't know which is worse, actually. 
because there are very many people you come across these days who know exactly how the system to be, should be changed, but very few who know about what the system actually is. Um, I therefore teach a course on this uh, at Sciences Po, which is full of facts. Um, I like facts, actually, um, and I think there are too few of them around in the world, and it'd be a good idea if all those people who had brilliant notions about improving financial regulation knew what the system was trying to do. But one interesting question for this um, er, 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 summit, I think, and for the focus of the discussion in your second group, is, is the EU at all relevant to financial regulation? And is the EU, particularly if we have a, a, a dismantling single financial market, is it a relevant grouping? Or do we really need global standards and not regional standards? Uh, pay um, of bankers may be a little example of this, which may be on your minds, where we now have an EU bonus, uh, bank bonus scheme uh, with a restriction. And I ask you the question, is it likely that all the um, investment banks in London and indeed in Paris will say, oh dear, oh dear, um, our people will now only have a bonus of one time salary? Or will they say, maybe they should be in New York uh, or Dubai, uh, or indeed possibly Zurich, although they have a different kind of rule? And the question is whether the EU can be a relevant grouping to grip some of the issues in financial markets, or should the EU's efforts really be focused on achieving good global standards which will apply um, everywhere. The third point is on infrastructure finance and international development, which is not so much my field, although I am worrying about airports quite a bit at the moment. But I would just here caution, uh, having looked at your slides and the background papers, a little bit of care with numbers. Once again, here are some facts uh, which I like. Um, it suggests that French infrastructure development aid is three times the UK aid. Well, this is simply not true. Uh, the UK's aid budget in 2010 was $13.8 billion, and the French aid budget was $12.9 billion. Let's call it the same. No doubt the aid is directed in different ways and in different places, but broadly speaking, our two countries spend the same amount. They have the same kind of commitment to international development, frankly, rather better than most other European countries as it happens. Uh, if you look at and compare with Italy, say, you will see a starkly different picture. Um, the UK government, in fact, has occurred a lot of political opprobrium recently for having kept the UK aid budget uncut when it is cutting spending in other areas, which is very politically controversial for a conservative uh, government. But I think it's very important to be clear about what we're talking about. The fourth area is alternative financial services, and you ask the very interesting question whether universities can establish alternative financial services. Now, this is an area which I find quite interesting, and there are some very promising areas of growth, particularly credit unions, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, which I think is quite promising, uh, crowdfunding, which is quite interesting, the two sometimes linked together, but if you look in the UK at things like Funding Circle, um, this is quite a successful uh, initiative and um, is, is quite a promising way of recycling funding outside the banking system. I'm not, however, currently aware of any universities active in it, though I do know of a few LSE students who've done this kind of thing after graduation, and it would be interesting to know if there are universities doing that. Uh, I have to say, personally, I'd be somewhat cautious about it, because as soon as you set yourself up as some kind of financial institution, you find yourself regulated. Um, and certainly, when I was at the LSE, I would not have wanted the LSE to be authorized by the Financial Services Authority, which would have uh, imposed all sorts of interesting constraints. But nonetheless, this is an intriguing area. Lastly, the gloomy topic of happiness. Um, well, of course, the cynics will say that political leaders become keener and keener on things like the Better Life Index when conventional indices of growth and unemployment are looking bad. So at that point, you are desperate to look for some other index on which you might look better. This was certainly true uh, of Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, who brought in a team of illuminaries like Joe Stiglitz to try to devise some happiness index, and it's also true of David Cameron, who's made speeches on the subject uh, as well. Now, it's true, I think, that happiness is quite poorly correlated with wealth. 
Uh, there's been quite a lot of LSE work done on this under uh, Richard Layard, um, who wrote a, an interesting book called Happiness Notes from a New Science uh, three or four years ago, which pulled together such data as we have on the way in which people's sense of well-being is correlated or is not correlated, co correlated uh, with economic uh, statistics. It demonstrates uh, quite interestingly that there is not much correlation beyond a certain point. Below a certain level of GNP per head, um, there is a reasonable correlation. But once you get to about $10,000 a head, it's very hard to say that getting from $10,000 to $30,000 GDP a head actually delivers overall a population that is happier. Many people are influenced more by relative wealth and relative well-being than by uh, absolute. Uh, he has a marvelous uh, cartoon in the book of a man clearly in front of his boss's desk. Um, and his boss, uh, you know, it's a, obviously a frosty encounter, and he is saying, well, okay, so you can't give me a pay rise, but can you give Smith a pay cut? Um, because that is what we are motivated by, is relativities. Um, and so the, you tend to get more disaffection, if you look at this on a national scale, when you get higher inequality. Uh, Pierre Tapie mentioned the growth in inequality, which I completely agree with him, is a very serious uh, phenomenon. And that is actually quite correlated uh, with people's sentiment about themselves. If they feel that the society is not fair, in a sense, and that other people are doing much better than them for no obvious reason, then they get quite unhappy. The important thing in this area, however, which I would encourage you to ask yourself, is so what? You can measure this stuff, and the measurement is, you know, is more or less reliable. Um, but what are you going to do about it? Uh, because if you don't answer the so what question, then you're just having an interesting discussion which isn't leading anywhere. Richard Layard's uh, work points to some rather interesting um, lessons, uh, some of which I think are rather practical, some of which you may be a bit pensive about. Um, for example, it's one thing that's very, very clear, is that um, unhappiness in families is very much influenced by mental health. In fact, interestingly, rather more so than with physical health. People who have nervous breakdowns and bipolar disorders and things, this is a very, very serious issue for families and friends and people get really, a lot of people get affected by that. And yet, if you look at the way we spend uh, health pounds and health euros, we spend far more on physical health than we do on mental health. I mean, certainly that's true in the UK. I haven't looked in France, but I hazard a guess that it is. There is very little constituency for spending on mental health services. And so he, Richard Layard, has actually turned himself into a significant campaign to rebalance the health budget and spend more of it on mental health. But there's some other things which are slightly awkward. What makes women unhappy? Divorce. Um, men, on the whole, are unhappy before they get divorced and cheer up pretty rapidly after they've been divorced. Um, women are not so unhappy before they get divorced but are very, very gloomy afterwards. So one lesson, Richard Layard says, provocatively, why don't we make divorce more difficult? I mean, some countries, why don't we just ban it? Um, or make it significantly more difficult. We've actually been engaged in liberal economies on a series of policies that make divorce really easy. And as far as women's well-being is concerned, this is not obviously a great thing. Well, this takes you into quite difficult areas. I encourage you not to think of the kind of better life index type of happiness measures as being, hey, you know, let's just all forget about economic growth and be nice to each other and measure things in a different way, and what do you know, we haven't got a problem. Actually, it takes you into some very interesting and difficult areas of social policy, uh, which are quite provocative. So, I think you have plenty to occupy uh, yourselves with uh, for a couple of days, between all the eating, drinking, and flirting, um, all of which, actually, uh, it is factually true, contribute positively to the Better Life Index. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you uh, later in the day uh, in the embassy and wish you a productive afternoon. Thank you. Bonjour, bonsoir à toutes et à tous, et merci à David et à son excellence. Moi, je préfère parler français 
à l'ambassade de Grande-Bretagne parce que ça donne l'occasion de faire référence à l'ambassadeur régulièrement comme son excellence. Et je sais que les ambassadeurs de Grande-Bretagne détestent ça. Absolument. Euh, donc, euh, oui, vous êtes d'accord avec ça. Tu as raison. Peter said, I was here um, as private secretary. Um, uh, this is where I worked, well, in the diplomatic service, work is kind of euphemistic uh, phrase. Mm, for, shame. Uh, shame. I was mainly drinking Paul Roger, uh, <laughs> which is uh, still a tradition in the Doesn't embassy, happen anymore. Uh, I believe. <laughs> no, no, I was no. told when I arrived it was absolutely crucial for me to keep the embassy's consumption of Paul Roger up. Uh, <laughs> Otherwise, the Treasury would cut allowances. Um, and now, that little anecdote uh, ensures that I won't be invited back uh, very soon. Um, now, I did speak earlier about um, some of the specific issues uh, you are addressing in your conference. And tonight, I'd like to touch on the more delicate topic of the British and French respective views on financial issues. And I said earlier that I would need to do so uh, in the safety of the British Embassy, where I have diplomatic protection on uh, <laughs> British soil, uh, and I'm out of um, the reach of the Renseignement Généraux or the uh, Direction de Sécurité de la ter du Territoire, or whatever those uh, ex exotic uh, bodies the French have to uh, police thought crime in France. Uh, now, on the face of it, the UK and France are pretty diametrically opposed on most of the issues relevant to this conference. We we'll take five quick examples. On the Euro, the French are in and the Brits are out. Now, a few in France, uh, Marine Le Pen, for example, and Jean-Pierre Chevènement may regret this, uh, but most think it is the French destiny uh, to be in Europe bound hand and foot to the Germans, um, and that the euro, in spite of all the problems, is a good thing, uh, malgré tout. In the UK, a fairly recent opinion poll suggested that 8% of people might be pro-euro in the right circumstances. Um, <laughs> although they aren't at the moment. Um, so we are not in, and we are not even a pre-in, um, and almost all politicians in the UK congratulate themselves on the great wisdom they showed in keeping us out. <laughs> Secondly, the banking union. The French are in, the Brits are out, and we will not be in as long as we're out of the euro, which is likely to be forever, uh, or possibly even longer. <laughs> and, um, when we come to the financial sector, the conventional wisdom is that the UK, far from a nation of shopkeepers, as Napoleon thought, is a nation of brokers and bankers that we are an aircraft carrier moored off the French coast from which American private equity, hedge fund and investment bankers fly sorties over France, picking off French companies. The UK manufacturing has been hollowed out while the French still make worthwhile things like Peugeot's, Chanel No. 5, uh, Piat d'Or and Johnny Halliday CDs. <laughs> <laughs> But related to that, that London is a kind of casino, uh, that there are financial activities that go on there which are quite unrelated to the real economy, while by contrast, French bankers travel uh, to the quatre coins de l'Hexagone uh, in search of SMEs in which to invest money uh, in the <coughs> interests of employing more French people. And lastly, that the British government is captured by financial interests that les milors de la city um, are in charge, influencing everything the government does, while for President Hollande, finance is le vrai ennemi. Um, <laughs> and that the respective government attitude in the last week or two on the EU bonus cap proves this point. The French supported it, the UK was the only opponent. The same is roughly true on the financial transactions tax. So that, I think, uh, in a pretty you know, objective and dispassionate way, uh, sums up uh, the respective uh, caricatures, if you like, of French and British views on finance. Well, how true is all this? Well, I think there's no denying some of it. Uh, in the UK, being pro-euro is indeed the love that dare not speak its name. Um, even ambassadors are not allowed to advocate the euro in public, whereas in 1975, in this place, you could not express any 
suggestion that there might be anything wrong <laughs> with the European community as it then was. This was uh, grounds for dismissal uh, from the Foreign Service at that point. Whereas now, um, I curiously find myself as one of the very few people prepared <laughs> to advocate British membership of the Euro in public. But then I am from Oxford, the home of lost causes. And <laughs> I do not uh, expect to win this argument. And of course it does mean that we will not be in the banking union, but nonetheless, although we might say that, it ought to be possible to find a decent modus vivendi on that subject, because financial regulation applies to the whole of the single market, which of course we are in, and not just to the euro set. So on that, I think, we are destined to find a decent agreement, and indeed there is already an outline of a decent agreement on how that will work in the future. Yep. Uh, but nonetheless, there is no point in denying that the euro is going to remain a fault line in the relationship on finance and banking union is going to get closer and closer together and that will be a difference because we will be out of it. But on the other issues, I think the caricature view I presented at the start is quite wide of the mark. On the shape of our respective economies, it is frequently misunderstood in France that manufacturing is about the same share of GDP, about 10% of gross value added, in the UK and in France. And for every Peugeot you have, we have a Bentley. Uh, for every Chanel number no. 5 bottle, we have a bar of Crabtree in Evelyn Sony. Uh, for every bottle of Piano, we have a bottle of Newcastle Brown. For every Johnny Halliday CD, we have one of Cliff Richard. Or, uh, one Direction. Uh, now, it is true that the UK is more reliant on uh, finance. And it is the case that actually it's about twice as much, just over about 9.5% of gross value added uh, is delivered by the financial sector um, and about 4.5% in France. The UK is actually smaller than. Luxembourg and France, rather peculiarly, has a smaller financial sector than Poland or Belgium, but slightly bigger to encourage the French here, slightly bigger than Slovenia. <coughs> um, but some of the London activity is, of course, undertaken by major French firms. I don't know if any of you have been to see the BNP dealing room at Marylebone Station. It's absolutely enormous. Uh, derivatives trading was actually trailways by Société Générale, mainly using uh, mathematicians from École Centrale, as far as I can understand. And most of the exotic derivatives trading is actually done by Frenchmen, like Jérôme Carriel, of course, <laughs> the, London, the London Whale was also French. I like, to point out, I like to point out two things when I get criticism of London. One, that we didn't have a British banking crisis, we had a Scottish banking crisis. And two, uh, that all the rogue traders are actually French. These two points <laughs> are very important to uh, remember. Uh, on the boards on which I sit, uh, Morgan Stanley, the head of investment banking in Europe, is a Frenchman. Um, on the Prudential, uh, the chief executive is a Frenchman. I'm also an advisor to the Mann Group, whose chief executive is a Frenchman. Not all of these people are card-carrying members of the Socialist Party, it would be fair to say. Um, but, in fact, the connections between the French financial and business community and London are extremely close, and some of these figures about the location of uh, activity are rather misleading when you look at where the firms actually are and what the firms do and where the firms are from. And so what about government uh, policy? Well, on the financial transactions tax, um, I have to say uh, that there is a serious issue about whether this is the right answer, and I think many of the arguments about the financial, tax, financial transactions tax are not properly uh, displayed in France. The IMF was asked uh, to look at what would be the appropriate tax to levy on the financial sector if you wanted the financial sector to make a greater contribution to the costs of the financial crisis. And the IMF did a lengthy review, a weighty paper, and concluded that the right answer was a balance sheet levy on the banking system, something which uh, the British government actually did impose uh, for two years. Uh, because a financial transaction tax, as they pointed out, will fall very heavily 
on pension funds and life insurance companies and on savers in those companies who actually had nothing to do with the crisis and most of whom in the UK and in France actually managed their way very sensibly through this crisis. But they will be now the people who are required to pay a large part of the tax to supposedly uh, fill in the hole. I think that's just, in my view, it's a, it's a wrong policy prescription. On universal banks, another issue which is current. Uh, curiously, it is the case that the UK is considerably tougher on this point. Um, the uh, French government have chosen a very weak version of the Volcker rule in the US uh, to impose on French banks, uh, cutting off some of their proprietary trading and requiring it to be held in a sub subsidiary. In the, in the US version, the Volcker stuff has to go completely. In France, it just has to be separately capitalized. Whereas the UK is legislating for uh, the recommendations of the Vickers Report, which imposes a ring fence on retail banking, very much like the Lickenen Report, which is recommending something similar in the EU. But the French government have actually chosen to implement something much more feeble. Um, as far as the banking system, and the press, uh, whether this is true I couldn't possibly comment, but the press say that essentially this is because BNP and Socgen and Credit Agricole have a very strong power with the government and push the government back from the original ideas as to how to deal with the too big to fail problems of universal banking. So things are not quite as they seem on all of these uh, issues. There is a much more complicated set of arguments about what an appropriate regulatory framework for the financial sector is. And the pity, in my view, is that in the EU, uh, attempts to reform financial regulation in a rational way, which derive from a problem emerging from the financial crisis which affects all member states, has become a series of dysfunctional disputes. Not all of them, by any means, between the UK and France. Obviously, on the future construction of the Eurozone and on banking union, it was between the Germans on the one hand and most of the Eurozone on the other, uh, who wanted a different construction of banking union which would be more robust. Um, but undoubtedly, it, there are a number of issues on which the UK and France are not seeing eye to eye. And in my view, that is unfortunate, uh, because in fact, I think, it would have been possible uh, to produce a more rational set of measures had the governments been prepared to work more closely uh, together. So I find this slightly depressing um, for those of us who have been involved a long time in Franco-British uh, relations. And so my one encouraging thought uh, before I close tonight is that maybe the idealism of youth uh, will be able to find a better way um, of resolving some of these issues in a way which meets the reasonable interests of the two countries. A troisième voie, as we now no longer call it in the UK. At least, uh, I hope so, uh, because if you take up this baton, uh, His Excellency and I, uh, in the declining years of our careers as we totter towards our twilight homes, can get back to doing what we do best, which is drinking champagne. Thank you. <laughs>